Well, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming out. I'll say really quickly, no pressure, but it, it's a large room. If you want to kind of come down towards the front, it, you, you may be able to hear a little bit better. Um, no pressure. Uh, but hello, uh, I'm John Hay, uh, an associate professor of English here at UNLV. Uh, I'm a member of the faculty advisory board for the UNLV Great Works Academic Certificate Program, which is sponsoring today's lecture with support from the Teagle Foundation in partnership with the National Endowment for the Humanities. Uh, I encourage you to learn more about our Great Works program. Uh, at its core is a 12 credit certificate program for undergraduates, but we also put on uh, a lot of other events like this one that are certainly open to everyone. There's a book club that's open to both undergraduate and uh, graduate students. Uh, so please do check out our website for more information. You can just Google Great Works uh, UNLV. Uh, today I'm very pleased to be introducing Dr. Paul Contino, who is a distinguished professor of great books in Seaver College at Pepperdine University, where he also helps run the Great Books Colloquium Minor. Professor Contino graduated from the State University of New York at Binghamton, and he went on to receive his master's degree and PhD in English from the University of Notre Dame. A specialist in the field of religion and literature, and an expert on both Dante and Dostoevsky. He is the author of the book Dostoevsky's Incarnational Realism, Finding Christ Among the Karamazovs, published by Cascade Press in 2020. He is also the co-editor of Bakhtin and Religion, A Feeling for Faith, published by Northwestern University Press in 2001. And he has authored dozens of academic journal articles and scholarly essays on a wide range of subjects. Today, he will be speaking to us about Dante's Divine Comedy and our pilgrim journey. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Paul Contino. Let me get this right. This is the microphone. It's mechanical stuff that gets me every time. But I think if I put this in my pocket, all will be well. All right. Well, thanks so much, John, and thank you all for being here at the end of what it may have been a long day for you. I just met Roberto. I'm really glad. Looking forward to questions, you know, conversation. I'm going to talk for 45 minutes. There's 100 cantos in Dante's Divine Comedy, so I picked 100 slides. And my goal, I know it's a lot, but I, 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 we can get through all of them in 45 minutes, or 40 minutes, I think. Uh, it's a tall order, but uh, I think I can do it. Um, I want to say that I'm especially pleased to be here with my wife, Mary. She is over there in the middle row next to her brother, Tommy, who I'm really glad to see. It was a surprise. And uh, Mary graduated from UNLV. Ma bachelor, yeah, please, a round of applause. And a master's in English. And we were married here at the Guardian Angel Cathedral. Um, and uh, so Las Vegas, in some ways, feels like coming home to us. And uh, so we're really glad to be here. Uh, my title is Dante's Divine Comedy as Our Pilgrim Journey, um, and uh, I want to begin, uh, I almost became a therapist, believe it or not, so I'm going to begin with like a therapy question. You know how Freud did free association? It's like, just go with this. Um, I'm going to say a word, the first word that comes to mind, tell me what it is. Dante. What was the first word back there, if you don't mind me, me asking? Please? Inferno. Inferno. Anybody else Inferno? OK. I think there's a big video game, and there might be six of them for all I know. Usually people think hell, right? Um, I have uh, an object here, but um, I am not even going to begin to tell you my purpose until Good Spencer comes in and pushes the button that will turn me into a PowerPoint presentation. So that this is being recorded, by the way, for the ages. So when you do ask your questions, make them good ones, because YouTube audiences will be watching. One last thing, I just press this little button right here to move the slide, right? Just like anywhere else. We've already done this. You've already passed. You're, you don't need therapy. You're all good. So uh, I'm going to go to my literary scholarship. This is like a really long summary, but I want you to, I'm going to read it aloud um, so you know where I'm going with this. I believe that at the heart of Dante's Divine Comedy, and that's Inferno, Purgatory, and Heaven, is a vision of love, the love that moves the sun and the other stars, but also the will of an errant Florentine pilgrim who is guided by others and calls his fellow pilgrims 
who are we, his readers, to follow him on his journey. He first ascends into hell, then ascends up, first Mount Purgatory, and then into heaven. And Dante, the pilgrim, grows into a deeper understanding of the ways love can be misdirected, but also the way it can be properly directed to the love of God, the love of neighbor. The whole journey, in a sense, is in that way purgatorial. He's He's going through a conversion experience. I'm halfway through this wonderful book by Dennis Turner, uh, Dante the Theologian, and uh, I'm influenced by and, and agree with his claim that the whole journey is purgatorial, purifying. Dante learns humility by seeing sin for what it really is through the practice of penance, but more crucially through his heartfelt experience of penitence, the act of confession, and his willing acceptance of grace, which is often mediated by other people, um, especially a woman named Beatrice, whom he loved since he was a kid in Florence. Thus prepared, Dante will be granted a luminous vision of communal beatitude, heaven, the human participation in the divine love of God. Only then will Dante the pilgrim be ready to become the poet, the poet who writes the poem called the Divine Comedy, Comedy because it has a happy ending that he offers to us, his fellow pilgrims. So we'll look at his journey by looking at a few selected passages and looking at art. Artists have been inspired from the very beginning, from the start of the illuminated manuscripts all the way to contemporary artists uh, by the Divine Comedy. So we're going to be looking at pictures by a number of, of them. Uh, my goal is the next time you get a free association activity and you hear Dante, you actually think love. Um, so, uh, and that you read or reread it. How many of you have read Dante? Just, okay, a good number of you. How many of you have only read Inferno? Okay, keep going. Oh, that's my wife, she admitted. I, keep going. I think after this, she's going to be reading this right away. Okay. Did you know that in 2021, we celebrated the 700th anniversary of the Commedia. Uh, I recommend a little YouTube um, series called 100 Days of Dante. It offers five to 10 minute presentations on each of the 100 cantos. I won't play the coming attractions. I will mention uh, that um, that series is sponsored by Baylor University. That's a Baptist university. You don't have to be Catholic to like Dante. There's my first claim, okay? Um, Pope Francis likes Dante. He says, he said it a couple of years ago, Dante invites us to become his companions in the journey. Today, too, he wants to show us the route to happiness, the right path to live a fully human life, emerging from the dark forest in which we lose our bearings and the sense of our true worth. Um, you don't have to be Christian to like Dante. I want to make that claim, too, and maybe test it in the, in the discussion that follows. But um, Dante was not always popular with the popes, shall we say. Um, the pope that lived in his time, Pope Boniface, um, lived during a time when popes were power players. And they owned things called the papal states. And they wanted land. And they were competing with the Holy Roman Emperor for land for power, for influence. And Boniface, who was pope at the time, is hated by Dante. Um, he makes it very clear that he expects Boniface to land in hell. He has other popes there. Uh, and he's probably the one responsible for Dante being exiled from Florence in 1302. He never returned there. Um, this is Dante's house, at least they claim it is, in Florence. He lived uh, there from 1265 to, to 1302. You notice it's, it's a tower. These old towers were built like this with the windows up top. They could pull the ladder in. There was a lot of, there was a lot of contention. You know, you wanted to protect yourself from um, civic conflict, from conflict with other city-states in Italy. So much war that, that, that Dante um, is uh, so sad to behold. He himself was in the military um, fighting Arezzo uh, back in his young days. If you look to the right of the picture, you see that arch back there it leads to a road. Right by there, there's a kind of yellowish building. That's a church. It's this church, the Santa Margarita, Mar Santa Margarita Church. Uh, the Cherchis were a powerful family. They sponsored it. This is the church where Dante probably saw Beatrice. Um, 
And uh, he says when he was nine years old, he developed a powerful attraction to her. He was, um, you know, just a youngster, but uh, he carried that torch for the rest of his life. There's an illustration of him kind of seeing Beatrice, her looking kindly at him. She doesn't always look kindly at him in this 19th century painting. Here he is at the Arno River. She won't give him the time of day. She's the one in the middle. She becomes for him a kind of image of the true good and the beautiful. She's not only beautiful, she's that, but she's also someone who for Dante really represents Christ. You know, all that is good in the human person, all that the human person is called to be. And when she dies in her 20s, he swears in the poems that he writes for her, La Vita Nuova, that he will not again write of her what has not before been written of any woman. That is, he promises to write a poem that what that has not yet been written of any other woman. I should have worded that a little bit differently. That poem is going to be the Divine Comedy. Um, this is a wonderful painting, I think the 1500s, uh, of Dante presenting his Divine Comedy to Florence. You know it's Florence from the dome of the cathedral, the Duomo. This painting hangs there. He never went back. He was buried in Ravenna, where he spent time in exile, uh, was in Verona. And you can see him gesturing toward uh, the eternal realms that he points to. Hell, purgatory, which is a mountain with Adam and Eve on the top, because that's the garden, the earthly paradise. And then the stars that represent the realms of heaven. That's going to be our journey. This is Dante presenting his poem to what he understands to be his fellow pilgrims. Now, this pilgrimage idea, well, if we're pilgrims, you know, we think of the pilgrims on Thanksgiving. They came from Britain to America. Where are we going? <laughs> we're going to heaven. Everybody is called to heaven. Everybody's called to participate in the divine life. That's Dante's, you know, Christian premise. He's writing for us in the hopes that his work will help us get there. And in this way, he's like a writer that you know of, I think, a thousand years earlier, 900 years earlier, St. Augustine. In his Confessions, which tells his life story, he says, I am making this confession before you not only with a secret exaltation and fear, with a secret grief touched by hope, but also in the ears of believing sons of men, sharers in my joy, conjoined with me in mortality, fellow citizens and pilgrims. In other words, he's writing it not to show off, not to tell, as Rousseau might in his confessions, all the bad stuff he did, kind of dramatizing it, but rather to say, from the perspective of my conversion, here's who I was, here's who I am now, here's my hope for all of us. Dante's doing a similar thing. Out of love, I would argue, caritas, um, charity. He's a mess, though, when the uh, inferno begins. Um, you know those opening lines. He's in a dark wood, a selva oscura. It begins on Good Friday. The year is 1300. I'm using Alan Mandelbaum's translation throughout, which is wonderful. Um, when I had journeyed half of our life's way. Notice the first person plural. Our lives. He's 35. He's married. He's got kids. He's one of the political power players in Florence, but he describes himself as lost. He's not going to be exiled to 1302. What's the problem? We can all think of people in our lives whom we know who could be incredibly successful on the outside who suffer from depression or some kind of crisis that throws them off. He's in that kind of a crisis. And he can't find his way out. And then he sees a mountain and a clearing. And he says, I'm going to go up that mountain and get out of here. And there's three beasts. Okay, So on a literal level, always read it literally and allegorically. He sees a, what does he see? He sees a, uh, uh, a fox, a wolf. No, no, I'm sorry there. How could I blank on this? A fox, a lion, and a wolf. No, a leopard, a lion, and a wolf. Mary, I should have practiced with you earlier. It's a leopard. He doesn't, that's William Blake's leopard, by the way. It Maybe it's a stretch, but the leopard represents lust. The lion, 
perhaps pride. Other critics see it other ways. And the wolf, avarice. He can't get past these beasts. He looks for help. He sees a guy. It's a shade. It's a spirit. Help me. Mercy. It's Virgil. Virgil says you're going the wrong way. You're trying to go up the mountain, but you've got to go down. You've got to go down in order to go up. St. Augustine puts it this way. Descend that you may ascend and make your way to God. He tries as a Platonist to make his way up. He falls down. He needs to follow the path that Christ takes, the path of descent, humility, becoming aware of his own sinfulness, and then he can begin to ascend toward God. Uh, So Virgil takes him into hell. Um, Hell is divided into three main sections. Incontinence, the least of the sins, you know, you lose your temper, or you lose yourself in appetite or in lust. You know, it kind of overwhelms you, overwhelms your rationality. Happens to everyone. Um, Not as bad as violence, violent against God, against neighbor, against oneself. Not as bad as fraud. Fraud is where you are doing malice of forethought. You're saying, I'm going to get this person. Now, there's ordinary fraud. You might be uh, somebody who, well, look at, the, look at the, if you could read it. There's, there's, there's panders and pimps there first, you know. I'm going to incite this person's lust and make a buck off of it. There's flatterers. There's people who sell religious goods, simonists. There's thieves, okay, etc. But then there's the worst kind of fraud where you cheat somebody you love. You invite somebody for dinner, you think they're friends, and you poison them, okay? The treacherous are in the worst part of, the lowest part of hell. Um, so when they cross the river, the Acheron, um, they are whipped and beaten by Charon, the boatmaster. And the weird thing is, as they curse themselves, they curse their families, they curse for being born, Dante writes that their fear is turned into desire. It's a complicated point, but I think Dorothy Sayers gets it right when she says that the inferno is the drama of the soul's choice. Nobody's zapped into there willy-nilly by a willful, voluntaristic God. C.S. Lewis put it this way, hell is locked from the inside. And I do think when you read closely the, you might call them, monologues by the people that Dante meets there, You can see the way in which they know themselves and yet perversely resist any outreach of of grace that might be coming to them. Um, They're they're locked so tightly inside their own selves that they don't even notice the neighbors next to them. One example that differs is limbo. Limbo's in hell, but it's kind of a nice-looking place. But there's no hope. And who does he meet there? He meets other great pagan poets. Uh, Virgil brings them over and says, here, meet my buddies, Homer, Ovid, Horace. And they say, come on, join us. My students see this and say, boy, this guy thought a lot of himself. But don't we teach him with, with Homer and the others? He knew what he was doing. Now, get into hell proper. The first is lust. For Dante, lust is the least of the sins, you might say. And in Francesca's story, She says, love made me do it. Um, The story is tragic. She's unhappily married. She sits down. She reads a love poem with her brother-in-law, Paolo, and you see what happens. Beware of love poetry. Um, uh, She calls the book, which was a poem about Guinevere, and Lancelot, and Lancelot kissing Guinevere, a Galahal, to kind of go between that book and he who wrote it. Notice she's like saying it was the book's fault or it was love's fault. And you can see the book dropped there on the floor. Um, Francesca's, Francesca's speech is so interesting. I mean, how many of you read Francesca's speech? Many of you know this. I mean, it, it's hard not like Dante to feel deeply sympathetic for this poor woman. The contrapasso, every circle of hell has a contrapasso. The punishment fits the crime. Just as lust blows people around, so too these people are blown by the wind. 
She's next to Paolo, but as Dante hears her story, she makes no mention of Paolo, just calls him him, by the way, he faints. He, after all, is a writer of love poetry. Does he see himself implicated in Francesca's story? He's really going through a story or a passage of edification here. He's learning, and he's not there yet, to see sin for what it is. Um, he sees it better in this encounter. Farinata is the one who stands taller. Cavalcante is kneeling. Cavalcante is the father of a friend of his. And when that man hears what he thinks Dante is saying, that his son is dead, he falls down in grief. He starts weeping. But the guy next to him, Farinata, just keeps going from where he left off. You'd never think that the guy next to him is just weeping for the loss of his son. Um, he's stone cold. He's solipsistic. He's narcissistic. Um, everybody in hell is rather isolated. It's complicated. I mean, later on, he's going to meet his old teacher, Brunetto, and Brunetto's going to be so happy to see him. I, I don't want to deny the complexities, but broadly speaking, one might say that everyone in hell is locked into a sense of their own sinfulness. A classic example is Ulysses, um, the false counselor who places a lust for experience, a curiosity for knowledge over the bonds of love. I'm just going to read a little bit from this amazing monologue by Ulysses. Neither my fondness for my son nor pity for my father nor the love I owed Penelope, which would have gladdened her, was able to defeat in me the longing I had to gain experience of the world, of the vices and the worth of men. And therefore I set out on open sea with a small company of men. I said, follow me, let's go past the pillars of Hercules, the limits that people have set beyond which you can't go. Don't you too want to know, to experience? And the boat sinks. Our prow plunged deep as pleased another until the sea again closed over us. He manipulates. You can see the men around him. Now look, Dante cares about knowledge too. He's better read than probably anybody in Europe. You know, He loves to learn. He can relate again to Ulysses. Here speaking from this tongue of flame, looking pretty ghastly too. And um, when he talks about this mad voyage that he takes, there's a lesson for Dante. Dante doesn't take this trip alone. He needs a guide. And his aim, finally, is very different. It is not for his own experience and knowledge, curiositas. It's rather a participation with a human community, with God's will, caritas, to help others. Um, Ugolino, another awful example. Again, complicated. The poor guy, you do sympathize. He's accused of treachery. He's locked in a cell with his kids that starve. And he sees his kids starving to death. But one of the sons turned to, turns to him and says, Daddy, why don't you help me? Echo. Scriptural echo. Scripture is everywhere. My... my, my, my um, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Think of Jesus' prayer on the cross. Um, the kid is like imitating Christ. He's innocent. And finally they die, and, and they say these awful things like, Daddy, you're hungry. Maybe you should eat us. It gets pretty ghastly. People speculate that he did eat his children after they died. But the key line, I think, is, within I turn to stone. What would you do if your, if your child was pleading to you for comfort, even in a desperate situation like this, what would you say? He doesn't speak. Um, there's a coldness. Whoops, there I go. I knew that would happen. All righty. So Ugolino is, um, is a terribly sad, uh, you know, I think of Brothers Karamazov and Ivan talking about the suffering of children there's a sense in which Dante is asking the same question. He curses Pisa for letting those innocents die. Curse you, Pisa. Um, he's like Yvonne, rebelling against the injustice of evil to innocent people and their suffering. But Ugolino is problematic. 
Um, he meets other treacherous people. He pulls their hair. Okay, that's a weird picture, isn't it? He's punching the guy in the head. He, he, he promises this guy that he's going to wipe away his tear if he tells his story. He doesn't. And he's kind of cruel toward the end. And I can't help but ask myself, is the pilgrim showing righteous indignation here, or is he somehow being contaminated by hell itself? i got to admit, when I teach the Inferno, I'm always glad to be done. The other day I was listening to it with Mary in the car. She was long-suffering. She listened to it, an audible version, which was quite good. I don't want to hear any more. Understandable. Um, <laughs> look what you have to look forward to in Candle 33. A three-headed Satan who dumbly, mechanically eats Judas in his first mouth in front and Brutus and Cassius in the other mouths. But what's striking is, is that the evil is so static, silent, mechanical. At a certain point after Virgil says, this is Lucifer, he says, we're out of here. He knows this image, by the way, and you can see it in the right hand, your right hand, lower, very far right, um, the baptistry in Florence, uh, where he himself was baptized as a mosaic. And you can clearly see that Christ is a lot bigger than the devil. But he seems to remember this image, and he puts it in his own inferno. They climb up over the hairy beast, who never says a word, and they climb out and see the stars. Okay, so it's 4.30. We have the room until what time, um, John? Right in between there. So I want to now take us up the mountain. You're ready to go climb a little bit? Um, there is Dante's cosmos. You see the Earth in the center. This is the Ptolemaic universe. You see, um, you see the way they've been going kind of upside down? There's the Inferno, and now they climb up, and they reach the shore of Mount Purgatory. Climb up that mountain, and then into heaven and toward God. So now they're going the right way. There's Mount Purgatory again. It's a seven-story mountain for seven deadly sins. And um, before they begin, Virgil, who's just this lovable father figure, almost a mother figure too. He's described as a mother who protects Dante when Dante's afraid. And here wipes his tears away and girds him with a, with a, with a reed, which symbolizes, because it, it bends, humility he still has to learn that virtue, and here's how he does it. One of the ways he, he observes the souls coming to purgatory. This is the ship. Helmsman is an angel. All the spirits on the ship sing with one voice, and they sing a psalm. When Israel went out of Egypt, that is, the story of Israel's liberation. Let my people go, right? Pharaoh releases the Israelites, and literally that's what happens Allegorically, Dante teaches his readers, read this as the liberation of the human soul, okay? So just as, in fact, he calls this poem a sacred poem. Read it like you read scripture, like you read a psalm. Literally, allegorically, this is a poem about freedom. Very different boat rides, yes? The images tell it all. By the way, those are by Doré. You know, Gustave Doré, those wonder... I, mean, I really should be mentioning some of these great artists that did this. Doré's are most famous. If Inferno is no repentance, Purgatory is penitence and penance, isolation versus community, bondage versus freedom, repetition versus a kind of teleological movement toward a goal, endless repetition versus movement toward a goal, curses versus blessings. One is eternal... One is temporal, one is marked by rebellion, one is marked by receptivity to grace, to others. One is marked by despair, purgatory is marked by hope. To get in, you've got to climb three steps. The three steps symbolize penitence. I did something bad, I feel bad about it. That's white. I see myself. Then there's this purplish, blackish, rough one. I've got to make a confession. It ain't going to be easy. You'll see that when it's time for Dante's. Dante's going to do his at the end. And then the red step is love. Now, I teach at Protestant schools, and Protestants will say often, maybe you can correct me if there's some people from Protestant traditions, you don't got to do the penance part. It's been done. It was done on Calvary by Jesus, period. 
Dante agrees. Done. We're saved by Christ, but the human person in the person's dignity is called to participate in that love. And who doesn't have a longing to make up for something when they've done something wrong? Or if they've been invited to a party to clean up a little bit before they show up. Think of it that way. You think of it metaphorically. These are souls who are desiring this path of penance. So I call it a school of virtue. If you don't like the classroom, you prefer the gym, you could call it a strenuous spa. There's going to be some pain. They're carrying bricks on their, on their shoulders there. But in Canto 11, they pray the Our Father, and this is the paradox, they joyfully receive the gift of divine adoption. You're our daddy. Jesus is our brother. But they respond then with their own sacrifice, just as your angels, as they sing Hosanna, offer their wills to you as sacrifice, so may men and women offer their wills to you. That's what they're doing. They're getting ready. They're prepping themselves for the big party in heaven. And I use this term. It's a fancy one from Rowan Williams, but I like it. There's a hybridity there of gift and task. You know, take what you've been given as task. And that's what they do. Throughout, Mary is the face that most resembles that of Christ. That's a line from Paradiso. But in purgatory, she becomes the powerful, primary, meditative image of all of the virtues, beginning with humility, but also generosity, mildness, zeal, poverty, temperance, chastity. Let's run through the sins, the penances, and Mary's image that they meditate on. So they're feeling the pain from the, um, the penance. These guys are, are, are burdened with this rock. It's like going to the, the weight room. And Dante, notice, he's bent down too. He's participating in this. They're praying and they're meditating. And the first image they meditate on is from the life of Mary. Here, it's the Annunciation where she says in Luke, here I am, the handmaiden of the Lord, emblematic of humility. The envious, eyes sewn shut, leaning on each other, because they were always competing against each other, versus generosity. She didn't care about a better vintage at the wedding of Cana. She turns the water into wine so that friends aren't embarrassed. You care about the well-being and the success of others. Wrath versus mildness. That's a guy named Marco Lombardo who got angry and uh, smoke. Just like you, you get smoky, wrathful, you lose your temper. Um, <laughs> Jesus, away for, was it three days? Finally, they come back to Jerusalem. They find him in the temple. Did you know Dad and I were looking for you? If you know the story, I mean, she's mild. She could have been otherwise. Uh, Asidia is a complex thing. It's not just laziness. It's kind of like a spiritual sloth, you know, whatever. It's a little like depression. There's a book called The Noonday Devil, came out about 15, 10 years ago. You know, he's describing depression. You just don't want to do anything. Versus zeal. What does Mary do? They're running, by the way. What else are you going to do if you're lazy? Um, she makes haste to Elizabeth to see her kinswoman when she hears that she's pregnant. Okay, mid-poem, which is crucial, because it's middle of not only purgatory, but the divine comedy, two crucial discourses. If you read anything in Dante, read Purgatory 16, Purgatory 17 for Dante's philosophy. First of all, free will is central. Marco Lombardo speaks of the source of evil. Where does it come from? Well, if the present world has gone astray, and you is the cause. But it's not all on you. There's also grace. Okay? Marco explains this to Dante. Virgil picks it up from there and amazingly says, love is the seed of you in every virtue, fair enough, and of all acts deserving punishment. Huh? Well, look at the way purgatory is structured. Love perverted, pride, envy, wrath. I love myself above others. I go on Facebook, I see somebody else has a better vacation than I have. I feel envy because I'm putting myself comparatively in relation with another and feeling that envy. Um, even wrath, right? Again, it's self-love, but it's perverse self-love. Love defective, acedia, 
Love excessive, I love stuff, I love food, I love another person's body, okay? You get the idea. Um, in each case, love is the operating motive. And um, speaking of free will and purgatory and the idea that it's not penal, it's not punishment, you're sent, when I was a kid, you know, it was like, you're sentenced to a thousand years in purgatory. And it was like really a bummer. It was all he like fire. I remember seeing a film when I was young, kind of scary. Statius has been there for a while. He was very prodigal with his goods. And there's an earthquake. And he says to Dante and Virgil, at that moment, my will was fully free. And it surprised me. I was done. You know when you're working hard on something and then surprise yourself that, like, you're finished? It's a great feeling. You think, oh, it's going to be an all-nighter. No, it's not. I'm going to get some sleep. You know, Statius realizes he's going to be okay. You know, and so, like, enough is enough. You know freely when enough is enough. He's on his way to heaven. Now, avarice, their, their penance is to grasp the earth. That's what they were doing, grasping stuff. The counter virtue is poverty, Mary giving birth in a stable in the manger. By the way, that's Giotto. You know Giotto. Giotto is Dante's buddy from Florence. The, the, these guys begin the Renaissance, right? It was another, I could have done a whole lecture on that. Giotto is the guy who brings more realistic representation into painting. They were buddies in Florence. Dante's doing this in literature. Now, this is an important point. I, I want to... I'm probably going to finish, I'm going to aim to finish at 5-2, okay? Would that work, John? All right. Um, Dante meets an old buddy. He's a poet. His name is Forese. Forese Donati. He's very skinny. He's fasting. You can see all those people are very thin. Um, he was a glut. Okay. He was also kind of a poetic competitor with Dante. I have a little speech about this, a little um, uh, presentation in that 100 Days of Dante, and I'm going to try to distill what I say here, because I think it, for me, opens up what purgatory is all about. He says, you know, they look up at this tree, luscious fruit, they can't eat it. Flowing water, they can't drink it. They're fasting. It's a lot like Lent. If anybody's going through Lent, you give something up. It's not, not a, especially pleasant. And he says, I speak of pain but I should speak of solace. For we're guided to those trees with the wealthy fruit, not picking it, by that same longing that led, that had guided Christ when he came to free us through the blood he shed. And in his joy, called out Eli. Now Eli is Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Huh? Joy? Doesn't sound joyful. But the joy, very, I mean, joy... How do we understand that? Christ is fulfilling his vocation. Forese is fulfilling his human vocation to participate in the love of God. Think of the penance as that. And by so doing, here's where the cross becomes a tree, a tree of life. He's participating in this. This is a Franciscan image. You see St. Francis at the foot of the cross. All the spiritual fruits that come from the cross uh, it's an image that um, I believe it's originally from Santa Croce, a church he would have known. The counter to gluttony is, again, um, well, what would it be? Uh, not necessarily fasting, but, um, you know, a kind of temperance. Mary does not want to throw down a few drinks, and that's why she asked for the wine. Again, she's doing it out of generosity for the others. The guy on the right might be another story who's sipping the wine, but that's... Uh... Okay, and then finally he has to walk through the fire. Now, this is by William Blake. Virgil's saying to Dante, come on, you've got to go through the flames. It's hot as hell. Not quite, it's purgatory. But, uh, it's, but, but, but you know who's on the other side? Beatrice. And he, and he entices her, him. And what's interesting about this circle of lust is that people embrace each other. And, and you know, we can get into this, um, you know, we're, we're in an age now where gay rights have been established, affirmed. Homosexuals go one way, heterosexuals go the other way, and they embrace. He doesn't put one on one level or, you, you see what I'm saying? You know, 
he brings them together in this communal embrace. Um, and the image of chastity is Mary, of course, the paradox of the virgin mother. How can this be since I do not know man? But um, this, this, the way he thinks of this penance, you know, that it entails not only an embrace, but a kiss, a chaste kiss. There's a tremendous embodiment in Dante, an incarnational spirit that, um, you know, you've got to attend to, I think, to appreciate him. Speaking of love, who might this be in the carriage, the chariot? It's Beatrice. Now they're in the Garden of Eden. Who does he see but Beatrice? There's an elaborate pageant. The chariot is drawn by a griffin that represents Christ. Different figures represent scripture and the church. Can't get into it. The more interesting scene is the climax. She calls Dante to account. She blames him for going astray after her death. And she lets him have it. She's described as an admiral. No messing around. This is not a dewy-eyed lover's reunion. This is tough. And he's brought to tears. He can't even get the words out. But he does finally confess. Mere appearances turned me aside with their false loveliness as soon as I had lost your countenance. You might say that for Dante, the penance, which he participates in, comes first, and then the penitence and confession. He's got to get, kind of got them reversed here. Um, Dennis Turner speculates, I, I need to think about this more, that you know how you, you do good things and you think, well, I'm a virtuous person. I've done the whole of Lent and I haven't had one drink. I'm pretty good. Um, no, that's exactly where pride comes in, right? I don't know that, that Dante is in that state, but he certainly has to come to terms on a personal level with his faults, and, you know, she plays the role of priest here. He confesses. Now, once the confession happens, he can be plunged into the river, cleansed in the waters of Lethe, which make you forget the bad stuff you did. You know when you're like, still remember things and you're punishing yourself? No more. It blots it away. And then you know, he adds this idea, now you remember, hey, I'm all right, you know? I'm, I'm a decent enough person. I'm washed clean. I'm ready to go to heaven. Wow. And Beatrice, or Beatrice will be his guide. Now the weird thing is, there's Beatrice, that's an illuminated manuscript, a beautiful, colorful one, but you see the map? Wait a second, my students say. Are you saying that in heaven, there's different rankings? They've had this in hell. They've had this in purgatory. Enough is enough, they say. Heaven is heaven, right? Eh, Dante says, not so fast. Let's make some discriminations here. OK. So the first place they go to is the moon. And he meets a beautiful woman named Picarda Donati, the sister of Frese. The story goes like this. Look at the left picture. She's a nun. She's a poor Claire, follower of you know, the Franciscan Claire, Claire, poor Claire's. They drag her away from the convent to get married to some guy she doesn't want to marry. She stays with the marriage. She says, you know, I don't think I'm that great. Because what Dante says is like, don't you want a better seat in the house? You go back. Look, look, where, look where the moon is you know, compared to way up close by the Empyrean. Don't you want a better seat in the stadium? Um, no, look at Lawrence. He accepted martyrdom. He's the one who famously was grilled and said, turn me over, this side is done. Um, there's a, a painting of him there. I, um, I don't desire anything more. In his will, there is our peace. Matthew Arnold said they're the most beautiful lines in all of com com Commedia. Think of it. And it's a very different conception of peace, of freedom, than we moderns have. We conform to God's will, we're at peace, and we're utterly free, beyond the capacity for envy, beyond the, the desire for anything else, beyond craving, utterly at peace. All right, you say so, Picarda. He meets others. I mean, it, it, you know, never think that, 
Paradiso, when you first read it, it just seems like variations on a theme of light. It becomes, would you say, an acquired taste, John, that, that there's a kind of rereading that's involved. It's, it's also a theology lesson. Where did Dante learn theology? People say, well, he learned it at the hands of Franciscans and Dominicans. These were two orders that were only 100 years old. And Santa Croce, the great Franciscan church, Santa Maria Novella, the great Dominican church, they weren't built up and glorious like this, but they were getting there, and there were smart people teaching there. I remember reading somewhere that people described it like Cambridge and Oxford. I mean, these were smart people teaching him theology. And what's really cool in Paradiso is, in real life, like there's competition between these two, different theological uh, emphases. And when Francis's story is told, it's told by the Dominican, Thomas Aquinas. He tells the story of Francis marrying Lady Poverty, Francis rebuilding the church, given the seal of approval by the most powerful man in Europe, Pope Innocent, visiting the Sultan, trying to bring peace during the Crusades, and receiving the stigmata. But it's a Dominican who joyfully tells the story. And when it comes time to tell Dominic's story, St. Bonaventure tells the story, the Franciscan theologian. He meets his ancestor, Cacciaguida, who died in the Crusades. And he says to Dante, you know, you've got a prophetic vocation. Because Dante says, you know, what I write, they're not going to like. He says, let them scratch where it itches. You know, you've got to say like it is about the corruption of the church, about the, you know, the violence that people are capable of. Your words will also serve as loving nourishment, he says. So this is uh, about in the middle of paradise. Dante is restored by this. At one point, Dante says, you know, okay, all this Christian salvation is well and good. What about the guy who's born by the Indus River who knows nothing of Jesus? It's one of my favorite moments. You're telling me he's, he's a goner? And at first, there's an eagle, the eagle of justice, explaining divine justice, who responds, giving a good theological explanation of providence, even predestination. Aquinas had it before Calvin had it. It's a little bit different emphasis. But yet, there's surprise. Because he'd asked this question, and then he sees a guy who died, who wasn't a believer, Trajan, who was prayed for by a pope, had a chance to rise from the dead and convert, and then a guy who was born thousands of years before Christ, the Trojan War, Riffius, the most virtuous among the Trojans. And he says, I saw those blessed pair of lights together like eyes that wink in concord. For me, and I, I write this in an essay, it's to me like the eagle is winking, saying to Dante, look, I got this. I mean, it's something like the spirit of Vatican II. In, 19, in the early 1960s, where all are, are, are welcomed by God. I mean, that's, that's Catholic teaching at this point. There's no, you know, there's rays of truth in all traditions. I'm teaching Asian great books now, and I'm reminded of that every time I do the Bhagavad Gita or the Tao Te Ching, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, that's Dante's question, too. Peter, James, and John question him about faith, hope, and love. I want to bring this home. If you know Frangelico, or he's a blessed, in other words, he's out of the way to sainthood, Angelico, nobody depicts heaven better than this Dominican friar who's got people dancing and smiling and singing and embracing. That's heaven for Dante. I mean, that's the spirit. It, 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 it's really, you know, you know the old talking head song, heaven is a place where nothing ever happens. It's happening. There's energy. Then there's another surprise, because the Trajan, Raphius, Raphius thing was a surprise. Dante thinks the earth is at the center of the universe, right? That's how Ptolemy said it was. Well, that little threshing floor, that earth that so incites our savagery, is not the center of the universe. Beatrice points him to a single point, the point that seems enclosed by that which it encloses, God, is the center of the universe. God who might be understood as a circle, an intelligent sphere, whose center, think of this, is everywhere, whose circumference is nowhere, all-encompassing, all-present. The end 
is Paradiso 33. Again, Dante receives a guide. His name is St. Bernard of Clairvaux. He was a monastic reformer. He says a beautiful prayer to Mary, full of paradox. My point to my students, who are often baffled by this, I mean, why does he need a mediator, an intercessor here? Community and the need for the mediation of others is right through the poem. It's a deeply communal poem for all of its existential, existential angst, you know, Dante lost in the dark wood. We get there through others. And the poet uses the image of a rose to describe this heavenly fellowship, communal beatitude. And yet, finally, the experience is ineffable, beyond words. Catholicism is known for its cataphatic emphasis. God is like a mother, says Julian of Norwich. God is like. The apophatic is God is like nothing else. God so transcends anything else, that's the apophatic. And that's where Dante is moving toward the end. I don't have the words for this, but I'm a poet. I better try. And no poet has groped for words and I think more beautifully described the experience of this mystical, ineffable then Dante, he sees three circles, okay? Three different colors. It's the Trinity, okay? That's an icon of the Trinity, but, you know, again, he sees three circles. And then he sees in the second our human image. This is a famous icon from Sinai, Christ Pontocrater, 6th century, right soon after the Chalcedonian formula, Christ is both human and divine, without separation or confusion. How can that be? That just sounds like a contradiction. And so, like a geometer, he tries to square the circle. He tries to figure this out. The two great mysteries of the, of the Christian faith, Trinity, Incarnation. And this is actually a picture some scholar discovered like two years ago of Dante doing this in the classroom. This is Dante. <laughs> He's got this image. How do you, it's impo it seems impossible. How do you square the circle? You can't. And he fails. And these are the last lines. Here force failed my high fantasy, but my desire and will were moved already, like a wheel moving uniformly, revolving uniformly, by the love that moves the sun and the other stars. So this is a diagram um, that's offered by the wonderful late John Frachero. And you see how the circle is at the center of the soul in the wheel up on top, but is also the center of the cosmos. The love that moves Dante's will is the same love that moves the sun and the other stars. In his final vision, Dante the pilgrim becomes Dante the poet, He's moved by love to write his poem in which he invites us to journey with him and to return to our true home. And that's all I got. Thank you very much for your attention. And I hope you have questions because I really like con conversation uh, about anything and everything. So please. Um, good. Yes. You tell me your name, but tell me now. You can. Matthew, question. Uh, yeah, speaking of uh, Bernard of Clairvaux. I was thinking when you were speaking of the, the steps of purgatory on the call of Bernard of Clairvaux's uh, The Steps of Humility and Pride. And it made me think that the image of the steps and the, just the idea of descending and ascending must have been uh, uh, pretty prominent in uh, Catholic theology around this time. Yeah. I was wondering if you could speak a little about that and how, you know, how specifically Dante relates in that respect to uh, his... Uh, That's great. Yeah, so... Um you're referring to Bernard of Clairvaux and the Steps of Humility. I've touched on that. Thank you for that. Yes, there is a lot of theological discourse that does talk about um, uh, steps, hierarchy, you know, movement. Of course, in the, in the um, hundreds of years later, Teresa of Avila has the interior castle. Where you move gradually inward, but you also can move outward. I've emphasized Augustine because I know confessions well. 
There's so much I haven't read. I need to read more Bernard, more of Dionysus, the Areopagite, Bonaventure, um, uh, The Journey of the Soul to God. These are the classic theological texts. Um, and then later texts. I mean, Julian of Norwich comes later, but, but others who, who talk about these, these steps, um, as you say, that, that I think do influence him. He read widely, but I emphasize, like, Fichero, the Augustine. Question in the back? Yep. Your name? Felix. Hi, Felix. Yeah, yeah, right. That's that's a that's kind of a classic question for all Christians, isn't it? You know, um, I mean, Nietzsche is going to come along in the 19th century and says that's the problem with Christians; they don't put enough emphasis on this life. Um, Christ said, "I come to bring you life and life in abundance." Uh, theologians talk about eschatology, the end of things, as both here and now and still to come. When he saw Beatrice walk in the streets of Florence, he felt like he was getting a glimpse of heaven. Um, when a Christian goes to Mass, the liturgy, the liturgy is a glimpse, you might say, of heaven. And it sends you off at the end, you know, go in peace, out into the world, make it a bit, make it a bit more like heaven. You know, you've got a duty to do that. Um, I think Dante is one of those poets... I don't see a lot of like, this life is just a veil of tears. Let's just get rid of it as fast as possible and uh, make our way to heaven. There's a poor guy named Pierre de la Vigne who takes his own life, and he's in the inferno. He, he's one of the suicides. He despairs. Uh, you can't rush the process. And while you're here, I think Dante is saying, do your work. And this, that, that, that labor that you're referring to matters um, a lot. Please, uh, Roberto, right? Good. Um, question about the crossing the Lake River. Yeah. Well, yeah. going into it. Yeah, to plunge into it. Yeah. If I understand correctly, the Greeks said that you had to forget yourself when you crossed that river. What was the, what was the purpose? The perception in Dante's time. Yeah. Did they have the, the idea that they had to forget themselves in life? Yeah, yeah, especially in that case, like forget the fact that you sinned um, or, or forget it in such a way that you don't berate yourself for it. You know, it washes away that impulse to self-castigation. You mentioned the Greeks. I, I, one thing I, I didn't emphasize, everywhere is scripture. Everywhere, though, too, is what we might call pagan mythology. So sometimes my earnest Christian students will say, why all these references to Greek and Roman gods and Greek myths? Well, again, St. Augustine's my, the guy I turn to. Um, I'm supposed to stay in the camera here. He calls it Egyptian gold. Um, we decorate the Ark of the Covenant with what we get from these other cultures, you know? And he uses everything he has. I mean, in this way, he's like a Renaissance person. You know, they're discovering Plato's dialogues, Aristotle... Uh, and and Dante is is eating this stuff up, you know, and uh, he's using it. So he uses the Lethe in a similar way, um, but to talk about the forgetting, yeah, in a way, I mean, self-castigation can be another form of narcissism, right? I mean, you can be locked into your own um, self-torment. BDSM. Say again? BDSM. Say, what, what does that mean? BDSM. BDSM. Tell me, what, what, I'm not hearing it right. What? Uh, what is it? Uh, Sadomasochism. Oh, yeah. I mean, Dostoevsky's good at portraying those people. Yeah, they, they just uh, they, they 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 consume themselves with uh, with self punishment and and they make an act a dramatic act of it as they drag everybody else into it. Other questions or clarifications, please. I, uh, What's your name? Oh, Andrew. Andrew. Yes. Is that Dante peppers his pagans throughout the levels? He doesn't just condemn them to 
to hell. To limbo, yeah. To, or, or, right, right. Yeah, you have Cato in purgatory. Yeah, you have Cato in purgatory. Yeah, so, but, so why is Virgil, is virtuous enough to read Dante through as part of his pilgrimage? He and he doesn't, he's Andrew, himself. your question is my question. I, I am, I don't know if I've ever actually had nightmares about this, but I've certainly <laughs> consciously asked, what about Virgil? If Cato, if Trajan is, if, you love Virgil by the end of this poem. I have a hard time with, with those critics who say, well, no, no, he's a pagan. He has to live in hell. I, I, I have a very hard time with that. I think that the, especially as you get toward Paradiso, there are these surprising moments of, you know, um, openness and surprise and reversal of expectation. Um, and Dennis Turner responding to a recent book by David Bentley Hart, you know, dare we hope all are saved, you know, that all are saved. The whole question of universal salvation has been, if you, if you follow some of this stuff, you know, if you believe in the afterlife, um, well, is there really a hell? Uh, von Balthasar uh, wrote the book, Dare We Hope, That All Are Saved. He said, yes, we, 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 we're, we're duty-bound to hope for the salvation of all. God desires the, the salvation of all. Um, how does it happen? You know, von Balthasar, Karl Barth, you know, what if hell exists, but it's empty, you know? Um, Hart is pretty critical of Dante. Turner defends Dante, but still comes down with the comes up with the thesis, which I'm, I'm still trying to get my head around, that hell is impossible. He shows you exactly what sin is, but finally it is an anti-narrative, he calls it. It's there for the edification of Dante, not as a divinely willed torture chamber that exists for eternity. It's something different. So, you know, Vir and, you know, even Virgil and Limbo, I mean, that, that to me is my, you can't help but love Virgil. And the other thing is, Virgil in Purgatory, he does know that Jesus is the Redeemer. He speaks about Jesus coming, freeing the souls from Limbo, who were the Hebrew patriarchs. He speaks of the Trinity and the Incarnation in, in Purgatory. He gives Dante some theology lessons. So there, there's, there's little, little hints, you know, throughout that I think it's more complicated. So is there hope for Virgil? I give an affirmative. Yes, exclamation point. Yes. Others, please. Um, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, so my question was about what role Virgil plays in the Christian narrative of the Beatrice, who right. Of love. Right. So she doesn't fulfill the same necessarily the same role as Mary or doesn't present the same way. And then there's Francesca, whom Dante feels sympathetic towards despite, you know, despite her story. Yeah. So how do you see how do you see this or how do you see virtue being gendered? Um, in, you know, according to Dante with the way he presents the women characters. So my first response would be, how, are, how does he gender virtue, we might say? How are women presented? Um, he loves women. Okay, clearly, you know, Beatrice, you know, she plays the role of a priest. Um, what troubles me, he marries a lady named Gemma. It's not spousal love, right? It's still kind of like courtly love. And that's problematic. You know the old courtly love thing where you love the woman from a distance? You never kiss her. You never even hold hands. You just, ah, oh, you know, there she is, this gleaming ideal. That could be kind of problematic, right? Okay, so th th that's, that's one piece of it. But on the other hand, I love the way he draws from the life of Mary, which can be easily overlooked in the Gospels, all these wonderful prosaic events, visiting her, her cousin when, when she's pregnant, you know, turning water into a wine at a party. I mean, these little things that she does. Um, you think of Mary before the cross, you know, the Pieta, but it's this ordinary stuff that this woman, um, I mean, I do think for Dante, Mary presents the apex of what a human being can be. And that's actually fairly consonant with, I think, Catholic and Orthodox theology. I mean, Mary is the model of receptivity to God's will. Uh, and there's, I mean, feminists have written about Mary, right? There's been, there's been books the last 20 years on, on Mary. Uh, you know, um, 
Does the virgin mother idea then cast this into a problematic category? Um, but it's, um, again, I look at those images by Jodo. I mean, a mom holding a baby, you know, uh, at a wedding. It's, it's, it's earthly. So I, my, my hermeneutic, my gendered hermeneutic, and, and my wife may wish to chime in here, is certainly much more uh, one of trust toward the equality of women and men in Dante's vision than one of suspicion, if that helps. But if you want to challenge me, go right ahead. I'm used to it. <laughs> Mary, anything to add to that? Or maybe you have to keep reading. We'll just say what about the male gaze. The male gaze. Well, OK, good point. <laughs> What's he doing at church nine years old, checking out this pretty girl when he should be paying attention at church? <laughs> the male gaze. Yeah, the male gaze gets guys into trouble. There's no doubt about it. And, uh, you know, I mean, that's not satisfactory. I mean, I, I, I don't think that Dante's affirmation of the virtue of women can be reduced to the male gaze. I think that the way in which he praises Beatrice, not only for her goodness and her truth, but for her physical beauty. is a classic work by, um, classic work whose name I, uh, The Way of Beatrice, okay? Who, who's the, does that, you, the name will come to me in just a second. He knew C.S. Lewis and all those fellows, one of the inklings, um, that emphasizes the incarnational quality of Beatrice. It's a woman, flesh and blood, he loved her, okay? I mean, he didn't, they didn't, marry each other, obviously. But um, there's, there's a, a gaze which is not the male gaze traditionally clutching, grasping, possessive. It's a gaze that is receptive and is inspired okay, and edified. Please, other questions? Anything at all? Please, John. I, I, I just, it, throughout your talk, you're sort of implicitly suggesting that of the three books, the Purgatorio is maybe your, your, your top one. Is that, is that fair to sort of say that? It's, it, you're getting there, but finally, I would say that. I think Purgatory is most like this life. Like if you're trying to read a book, like let's say you want a self-help book, Dante's self-help book is Purgatorio, okay? Paradiso is the aspirational mystical. And it, it is an acquired taste, so now... Like, what's the book that I'm always seeing new things in and it's blowing my mind? You know, this is why we were talking earlier about, you know, visions. You know, it's Paradiso. I mean, the, 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 the potential that is, um, you know, so explosively, miraculously, colorfully illuminated there is just uh, amazing. Well, sort of my, my sort of larger yeah. question, uh, and this is fine, uh, is that... Uh, if, as a teacher, right. when you're ah. coming to students for the first time and they've perhaps never read you know, Dante, yeah. uh, and as you said at the beginning of your talk, whatever yep. the Inferno, yep. do you ever feel like, I'm just going to teach we've done it. Paradiso and not the Inferno? No, what we, what we chose was Purgatorio then. Okay. We did, I remember way back when, when I used to teach at Valparaiso University in Christ College, we chose Purgatorio. I was relieved. I mean, you look, the characters in Inferno are so memorable. They're like amazing. They're like Shakespearean characters, right? And they're complicated. Um, but purgatory is, uh, you know, I really do read literature for pleasure and edification. I'm an old timer in that way. <laughs> and I think purgatory is quite edifying. You know, it, it just, uh, the more you read it, uh, the, more you, the more you see that. And uh, it's funny that he meets this old flame of his, and she gives it to him. I talk about the male gaze. I mean, it could have been like, oh, there she is. She's so beautiful. No. Bam. You talk about, you know, woman's agency. I mean, it's, there she is. She's calling him to task, you know. So it's got so much. So I would go, if you had to pick one, that's the one. Don't leave them in hell, whatever you do. Please. Hi, I'm sorry I came in late. This is the first part of your It's talk. okay. Mentioned the uh, word "free" yeah. in connection with uh, purgatory. Right. Does it appear uh, Paradiso? Good question. Does freedom pertain only to the will, or is there a higher, sen uh, a, a different sense of freedom? 
That's good. And what is found in purgatory? So let me, re- let me respond by saying this. Neither in purgatory nor in paradiso, because purgatory is a kind of waiting room, not a waiting room, but it's a prelude to the paradiso. Wait, wait. Yeah, you can't sin. Wait, you mean I'm not free to sin? I can't wake up grouchy one morning and say, you know, something mean to somebody? No, you can't. What do you mean I can't? Because it's forbidden? No, because you cannot. Your will is incapable. Well, how is that freedom? If I'm not free to be grouchy or to be this or that or the other thing, how could I be free? It's a very different conception of freedom. Freedom is found in the will of the loving creator that intends you to be fully free, who is in God's self fully free, and to the extent that you participate in that image and recovered likeness of the divine, you're fully free. I mean, what is sin but bondage in Inferno? I am locked in the prison house of self, and I'll never get out of it. I can't get out of it. It's all I can talk about. Purgatory, they're getting over. So, so in paradise, they don't talk it. They, they just are it. They are utterly free. I mean, Picard says, in his will is my peace. Utter conformity to God's will, it's perfect freedom. That's not a quite, I, I want now to go through paradise and find all the what times when freedom shows up, but it's a partial answer. Does participate mean perfectly imitate? Perfectly imitate. Or you could push it further. Does it mean complete union and obliteration of individuality? You didn't ask that, but I'll say no. They're all individuals in heaven. They are particular persons who retain their, their, their specificity. Um, perf- yeah, as perfect as a human can be. You know, as perfect as a human can be. I mean, God is God. There's still the creator-creature distinction. I don't think that in Aquinas or in, or in Dante... You know, in some of the mystics, people say that when you read, um, and some of you know this better than I do, um, uh, again, uh, I'm, I'm, why am I blanking on some things? Uh, some of the, who, you help me, you're, you're a mystics reader. Um, Eckhart? That's the guy I was thinking, that I was trying to think of. I mean, Meister Eckhart, you know, that, that Meister Eckhart, good Dominican, but, uh, you know, is he, getting to, is, he, is he retaining the creator-creature distinction clearly enough? What would you say? I mean, I, I think it's it starts to break. It starts, starts to break, uh, starts to break down more. In, <laughs> and and you're not the only one who who, who suggests that. Uh, so that's you know when you say perfectly, you know human, but not imperfect in the sense of sin. Sin is no longer possible. Okay, what time is it? I don't know. That's not a signal to end. I'll I'll talk all night if you want to. Oh, good. Good. One more question. All right. Oh, we got two. One and two. No, let's do two. Please, please. One, two. Hi. Um, so, and correct me if I'm wrong here, this is my understanding of stuff, but uh, in Inferno, a lot of the sinners that are people who basically chose sin sometimes. Well, everybody chooses sin. Like, well, the incontinence, it's like you fly off the handle. You know, you, so, but still, there is free will. Right? That's what Marco Lombardo makes clear. But the weird thing is they seem to be choosing eternal punishment. They're choosing hell, right? Okay, so but very weird, isn't it? Yeah. 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 What I was thinking is, like, so those people are like choosing sin, and then in connection with the people of justice, like those people by the Indigo River and stuff, yeah. they may still be sinning, so would they still go to paradise even though they're sinning because they're on a pair of sin? <laughs> Does ignorance mean that you are not culpable? Uh, Aristotle would, would say yes, ignorance to a certain degree does relieve one of culpability. Did I know it was wrong to have, I don't know, think of different cultural practices, you know, uh, that, that are very different from the West. So I suppose that, yeah, that wouldn't be a sin. On the other hand, you have like natural law, you know, it's written in the human heart. You know that you can't kill somebody. I mean, murder seems to be a universal, right? Of course, we still go to war with each other. But murder is murder. You can't do that. Um, so whether you're from India or Africa or wherever, you know, that, you know that's wrong. Um, I think he'd be a natural law ethicist to that degree. Okay, yeah. 
And one more, please. Yeah. Do we see the prayers of the living in uh, purgatorio? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thanks for mentioning that. Do we see the prayers of the living in purgatorio? Yes. We hear again and again requests for prayer. Please, when you go back, will you ask my daughter to, pr- to pray for me? My wife seems to have forgotten me, but, you know, I think my daughter might pray. I, you know, and would you please remind them, because their prayers can help, shall we say, speed up the process. Kind of vulgar, because again, it's in Dante's schema, a kind of human discernment when enough is enough. But we're all in this together, and they can pray for us. I mean, this is, this is why, part of why I, I am a Catholic, by the way. I, I mean, I, I'll just tell you right now. And part of what I love is, you can pray for them, they can pray for you. You know, my mom and dad, not perfect. But, you know, wherever they may be, they can pray for us as we pray for them, right? So there's a, a community extended through space and time, you see? And uh, that's um, very, very much in Dante. Well, I was just thinking of David's question yeah. about will. You yeah. know, at least you're seeing the will of the living. Yes. Uh, in, in that. Oh, you are. You do see the will of the living. In fact, oh, there's, well, there's some examples where people credit the prayers of others very specifically for helping them along. Remember that? Yeah, and it's, it's really kind of beautiful. There's that, that connection. Yes. Yeah. Well, thank you for being such a nice audience, and uh, I appreciate meeting you. Thank you.